You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Ronald Reagan was born on February 6, 1911 in Tampico, Illinois. His mother's name was Nellie, his brother's name was Neil, and his father's name was Jack. Jack made a living as a shoe salesman, while Nellie just stayed home and was an occasional shop clerk. Jack was an Irishman who found the worst in people. He had grown up in an era where shop owners had signs on their store windows that said, No dogs or Irishmen allowed. He also had a drinking problem which instilled in Ronnie a lifelong aversion to alcohol. Despite his drinking problem, Jack was a great storyteller and taught Ronnie the values of oration and speaking. These skills would serve him in both acting and public office. Nellie was just the opposite always and found the best in people. As a matter of fact, she even provided hot meals for the prisoners at their local jail. According to family legend, when Ron's father first saw him, he remarked, He looks like a fat little Dutchman, but who knows? He might grow up to be president someday. His parents wanted to call him Donald, but since one of Nellie's sisters beat her to it, they decided to call him Ronald. As Reagan grew older, he became very involved with his church by teaching Sunday school. During his sophomore year, Ron had to write English essays and read them in front of the class. When he got a few laughs out of the first, he realized that he enjoyed entertaining the class. So he continued on with his passion, which continued all the way through to his political life. There was an agent overseas and happened to be in Ireland and there was an emergency and it was necessary to contact him immediately. So they called in another agent and they said, now you'll go there, his name is Murphy, and your recognition will be to say, tis a fair day, but it'll be lovelier this evening. So we went to Ireland, little town in Ireland, into the pub, elbowed himself up to the bar, ordered a drink, and then said to the bartender, uh, how, how would I get in touch with Murphy? The bartender says, well, if it's Murphy the farmer you want, it's two miles down the road and it's the farm on the left. He said, if it's Murphy the bootmaker, he's on the second floor of the building across the street. And he says, my name is Murphy. So he picked up the drink and he said, well, it is a fair day, but it'll be lovelier this evening. Oh, he said, it's Murphy the spy you want. Well, he's... By the time he was a senior, he became very addicted to student theatrical productions. His drama teacher, B.J. Fraser, taught him the importance of analyzing the characters and to think like them in ways that would help him be that character while he was on stage. That kick of the third section today, sis. Fixed us straight and soon as I die. Nancy's that time. When Paul retires, I'm not going to be section bought. Hey. Mr. Monaghan, I'm Drake McHugh. Maybe you've heard about me. Do you wonder if you haven't, the way people gab? And most of what they say is true. But the one thing they can't say is that I ever do anything behind anyone's back. Well, I've been taking your daughter out buggy riding. I like her and she likes me. But I won't do anything in the sly, so if you've got any objection to my going on seeing her, now's the time to spit it out. Why? No, no, no. Now, what have you got to say? Won't you sit down and have some supper? In the 1920s, less than 7% of Americans attended college, and Ron was determined to be among them. So he attended a small Christian college called Eureka College. A few months before his graduation, Ron asked himself, what do I do with the rest of my life? His dream to be an actor was firmly planted. 
Reagan started getting the idea that Hollywood and Broadway were a long way away from Dixon, but not Chicago, which was the nation's hub for radio broadcasting. It hadn't occurred to me really what I wanted to do or anything except get a job of some kind or other. It was those kind of times. And then knowing that radio might be the shortcut to anything else, I said, I'd like to get into radio. I think I'd be a sports announcer. Every year, in order to escape the Iowa winter, Ron accompanied the Chicago Cubs to their spring training camp in California. On one of these trips, Ron asked an agent if he would be able to knock a few doors in Hollywood. Without saying a word, the agent picked up the phone and dialed the casting director for Warner Brothers. Before Ron knew it, he was at Hollywood performing his first screen test for the movie, The Philadelphia Story. Here was a guy who, at a time when, uh, in the Depression, when he signed his contract, when uh, America was stage-struck, uh, people wanted to be, uh, they'd wait uh, tables or uh, do all these uh, various menial jobs to get to be an actor, and a lot of people don't know that there were many people who had signed contracts who waited for years to get a picture made. He signed a contract and they made a picture immediately. In 1940, he played Notre Dame's legendary football player, George Gitt, in a film called New Rockney All-American. They're heading this way. That smashing bolt of Irish lightning. Those fighting sons of old Notre Dame charging across the screen in a roaring blaze of triumph. With Canute Rockney, the miracle man of football. The four horsemen riding again. They're all in it. And the sweetheart of them all, Bonnie Rockney. And what you're about to see is a deathbed scene in which Ronald often recalls his presidential speeches. This scene takes place when George Kipp is dying of pneumonia. Sometime when the team is up against it and the brakes are beating the boys, ask them to go in there with all they've got. Win just one for the kipper. I don't know where I'll be then, but I'll know about it. I'll be happy. In 1947, Reagan became president of SAG, a.k.a. Screen Reagan. Actors Guild. Last year, the contributions of 16 million Americans to the crusade for freedom made possible the World Freedom Bell, symbol of hope and freedom to the communist-dominated peoples of Eastern Europe, and built this powerful 135,000-watt Radio Free Europe transmitter in Western Germany. This station daily pierces the Iron Curtain with the truth, answering the lies of the Kremlin and bringing a message of hope to millions trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Grateful letters from listeners smuggled past the secret police express thanks to Radio Free Europe for identifying communist quislings and informers by name. General Lucius D. Clay now asks all Americans to join with him in a second great crusade for freedom to build two more powerful freedom stations that will send more messages of truth and hope through the Iron Curtain and to establish Radio Free Asia to stop the spread of communism in the Far East. The Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Or join in your local community. There's a sort of cluster of unhappy memories. This is, this, Ronald Reagan's one of the most optimistic people you'd ever meet. And in most of his life, uh, even during the, he's, this is a guy who goes out and is confident he's going to find work and does in the middle of the Depression when millions of people are unemployed, you know. He's a guy who's not stopped by uh, a, a would-be assassin's bullet or by cancer or by a lot of other things. But he's really, un, this is a really unhappy time. And I think that, that one of the reasons that his, his clashes with people who, who were real or perceived communist in Hollywood meant so much to the, him is that they occurred at a time of his life when 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 he was he was unhappy for other reasons. Ronald Reagan toughest year was in toughest period of his life was in before he had Alzheimer's was in 1949 and early 50 after his divorce from Jane Wyman and he was very despondent he was battling with the studios 
This happened to coincide with the investigation of the uh, House Un-American Activities Committee into Hollywood. The meeting will come to order. This committee, under its mandate from the House of Representatives, has the responsibility of exposing... Back in those days, Hollywood had a problem with communist invasion. Wherever they may exist. So Ron would take his time speaking against it. That such elements would strive desperately to gain entry to the motion picture industry, simply because the industry offers such a tremendous weapon for education and propaganda. Uh, I have seen things from time to time which appeared to me to be slightly on the pink side, shall we say. I have never read uh, Karl Marx, and I don't know the basis of communism beyond what I've uh, picked up from hearsay. What I've heard, I don't like it, because it isn't on the level. We have done a pretty good job in our business of keeping those people's activities curtailed. After all, we must legally recognize them at the present as a political party. On that basis, we have exposed their lies when we came across them. We have been eminently successful in preventing them from their usual tactic of trying to run a majority of an organization with a well-organized minority. During this time of turmoil, Reagan served as an advocate for Edgar Bergen, who was the father of Candace Bergen, and the puppeteer master of the one and only Charles McCarthy. After the show General Electric Theater ended in 1962, Ron moved on to be a Republican as his interest in politics began to supersede his acting career. In 1964, Ronald Reagan had the opportunity to do a speech called A Time for the Choosing on behalf of presidential candidate Barry Goldwater. I had no idea at that time that Ronald Reagan would ever want to go ahead in politics. I began to sense, though, during the 64 campaign of mine that uh, he was interested. My campaign wasn't basically directed at awakening the American people to the values of conservatism. That did, however, may, uh, get to be a big main thrust. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. A prepared speech to be delivered that night was handed to me. I read it over, and the thought came to me, this speech is not me. The thought came through my mind, what's wrong with Ronald Reagan? So we got in touch with him, suggested that this speech could be made by him, and with any changes he wanted to make. So uh, thank God he agreed to do it and he used the speech with some changes. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Thank you very much. And it wasn't long after that speech before literally dozens of Californians began to kick their money in and beg him to run, and, and he did. As of now, I am a candidate seeking the Republican nomination for governor. Do you discount the fact that many women may be influenced by the fact that you are a movie star, you're handsome and young, and that sort of thing? Well, now you can't have it both ways. Um, uh, some of the people on the other side have been suggesting that uh, before I became a candidate that I, I wasn't very... Um, um, acceptable as a movie star. In California, actor Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Reagan arrived to cast their votes in the state's primary election. 
He's the Republican nominee for governor. It's his first political contest. His landslide victory has national significance. If he wins in November, party leaders predict he may rival Nixon and Romney as a presidential candidate in 1968. Rom became the governor of California in 1966. He won by a million votes, which would be the equivalent of winning by about two million votes now against a guy who was one of the best politicians in the state, had beaten Richard Nixon, you know, four years earlier. Uh, 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 that was one uh, heck of a way to start your political career. He spent most of his time restore, restoring college campuses because they became battlegrounds for student demonstrations. This caused violent confrontations with authority. California was also in a financial mess and he promised to do something about it. And coincidentally, one of his strengths as a governor was dealing with the economy because that was one of his majors at Eureka College. He was simultaneously an ideologue and a pragmatist. He, was a, he wouldn't allow you to call him a politician, but he was a very, very good politician. He was a practical politician. And I think that most people uh, would agree that he was a successful governor in his second year. He put aside more parklands, by the way, than any governor except Earl Warren in the history of the state. And what is most important is that he became a steadily better governor. He was a better governor in his second term than he was in his first. In 1968 he announced his running for the presidency. I called this press conference to announce that I am a candidate for the presidency and to ask for the support of all Americans who share my belief that our nation needs to embark on a new and constructive course. Reagan lost in the GOP nomination against Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. When Jimmy Carter took over in 1976, that was when people started to beg Reagan for to run for the presidency. Now, if you watch this commercial campaign, you'll realize why that is. In 1976, Jimmy Carter promised to hold inflation to 4%. Today, it is 14%. He promised to create more jobs, and now there are 8 million Americans out of work. He promised not to raise taxes, but taxes have risen more than 70%. The time is now for strong leadership. Everywhere I travel in America today, I hear this phrase over and over again. Everything is going up. Where is it going to end? Record inflation has robbed the purchasing power of your dollar. And for three and a half years, this administration has been unable to control it. When President Ford left office at the end of 1976, the inflation rate was around 5%. Jimmy Carter told us that was too high, much too high. Well, this year, Carter inflation has hit 18%. I'm very worried, as all Americans are, and I'm prepared to do something about it. With re-election coming up in 1980, both Reagan and Carter agreed to a debate on October 28th. During this debate, Carter attacked Reagan by saying that he opposed Medicare benefits for Social Security recipients. Governor Reagan, again, typically is against such a proposal. Governor, <laughs> there you go again. Reagan's response to this made Carter look very sheepish on the, t on the television screen. In Ron's closing statement, he challenged the audience by asking if America was better off than it was four years ago. That is a question that we should be asking ourselves today. Next Tuesday is election day. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls. You'll stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? The polls on the weekend before the election were dead even. I'm not just talking about Carter's polls or the national polls. I'm talking about Ronald Reagan's polls. People right up to the weekend before the election weren't decided what they wanted to do. And then that Sunday before the election, the Ayatollah Khomeini pushed one more time against Jimmy Carter and everyone said, that's it. That's it, Jimmy. Go on home to Georgia. We're going to elect Ronald Reagan. He won by a large majority. And he brought to the office his political ideology and philosophy, which he understood full well, and it was part of his political strength. 
you knew where Ronald Reagan stood. He told you what he wanted to do with the presidency before he came, and he made every effort to do it once he got there. On the night of Election Day, Jimmy Carter called Reagan and announced his concession. For the very first time, Reagan's inauguration was held at, on the west side of the Capitol. When taking the Constitutional, he placed his hand on his mother's Bible with it open to 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It is my intention to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment and to demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. After only two months in office, Reagan was shot in the chest by John Hinckley Jr. Hinckley's reason for attempted murder was to impress actress Jodie Foster. When he was shot, he says to his wife, and he almost died. Honey, I forgot to duck. And he says to the doctors, as they're about to put him under to try to remove this bullet, which was that close to his heart, well, I hope everybody in this room is Republican. And the doctors said, well, Mr. President, today all of us are Republicans. In fact, the chief doctor was a Democrat who saved his life. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. Around this time, Reagan proposed a strategic defense initiative, which is a space-based defense system that was later dubbed as Star Wars. I am directing a comprehensive and intensive effort to define a long-term research and development program to begin to achieve our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. Ronald Reagan believed that anything that the mind of man could conceive, it could accomplish. Uh, that's both a strength and a weakness of him. He thought that it would be possible to construct this super shield, and there was really all the scientific evidence suggested otherwise, that, that you just, you couldn't, uh, it, it wasn't, if you stop 90% of the Soviet missiles, it, it ain't going to do the job. You've got to stop all of them. And nobody thought you could do that. But it had an impact. It had an enormous impact on the Soviet Union. For the past 20 years, we've believed that no war will be launched as long as each side knows it can retaliate with a deadly counter-strike. Well, I believe there's a better way of eliminating the threat of nuclear war. It is a strategic defense initiative aimed ultimately at finding a non-nuclear defense against ballistic missiles. It's the most hopeful possibility of the nuclear age. Delegates to this convention and fellow citizens, tonight with a full heart and deep gratitude for your trust, 
I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. 1984 was the re-election year for Ronald Reagan. He turned 73 that year and was classified as the oldest president to take office. This time his opponent was former Vice President Walter Mondale, who had former Congresswoman Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate. At one of the debates, a reporter asked Reagan if his age would be a problem in the campaign. Reagan had a good answer for this one. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. (laughs) Well, it just so happens that Reagan actually swept 49 out of 50 states and 54% of the popular vote. It was only after the Carter presidency and the election of Ronald Reagan that it seemed to me we returned to any sort of stability or equilibrium in the political system in the country. And that may be Ronald Reagan's greatest contribution. He brought a stability to the system. I think with the same token that dismantling much of the bureaucracy of government and reducing the burden of taxation stoked the fires of economic and social progress in this country and we are now reaping the reward. When I took this oath four years ago, I did so in a time of economic stress. Voices were raised saying that we had to look to our past for the greatness and glory. But we, the present day Americans, are not given to looking backward. In this blessed land, there is always a better tomorrow. He was a leader when it came to optimism. And far beyond the very acts of his presidency, he brought to this country a renewal of that optimism. And I think it can be properly argued that that helped the country then move ahead. In 1985, he met with General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev in Geneva, Switzerland to discuss arms control. After a numerous amount of meetings with him, he agreed to terminate the Strategic strategic Defense Initiative. Every time Gorbachev came to the United States, and I, when I was National Security Advisor, or whenever we saw him, President Reagan didn't want him to see our guns or tanks. He always wanted to take Gorbachev to a factory. He always wanted to take Gorbachev to a housing development. He always wanted to take him to a shopping mall somewhere. He always wanted to show him what can come from a free democratic, free economic system. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, If you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, down this As a result of Reagan's 1985 meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, the two signed an Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, eliminating Europe's intermediate-range nuclear missiles that pointed at each other in Europe. The INF Treaty, as it's called, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, which got rid of all of the intermediate-range nuclear weapons that were pointed at each other across the Iron Curtain in Europe. What makes that so significant is that it was the first time in history that we began to destroy nuclear weapons and eliminate an entire class of nuclear weapons. That took a lot of confidence building, it took a lot of negotiation, but it was done. And all those nuclear weapons of the INF category are gone. And it was from that that base level that we could then start doing other Uh, agreements that were very, very helpful. Finally, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. This caused the reuniting of East and West Berlin and other countries within the Soviet Union. As a result of Reagan's presidency, the people in the Soviet were able to cast their votes for the very first time since 1917. Libya was able to break from the Soviet Union by declaring its independence and restoring its 1938 constitution. In Czechoslovakia, the communist regime was voted out of power 
ending a 41-year monopoly, and a new conservative president was elected. It's been quite a journey this decade, and we held together through some stormy seas. And at the end, together, we're reaching our destination. The fact is, from Grenada to the Washington and Moscow summits, from the recession of 81 to 82, to the expansion that began in late 82 and continues to this day, we've made a difference. We've done our part. And as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.